national business leaders supporting an accurate census. When everyone counts, everyone thrives. Good afternoon, everyone. <laughs> Thank you all for being here this afternoon. I want to say that this will be one of the most important conversations we have for this decade. And thank you all for participating. When you leave this session today, we want you to truly understand not only that we have a 2020 census upon us, but the implications of this work how it is so important for the state of Michigan, for each and every one of us in this organization and the work that we do for our organizations, and why it's so important for children and families, not only in the state of Michigan, but nationally. Mm -hmm. And so today I have with me to have this conversation some very esteemed individuals, and I will introduce them quickly. I know our time is going to run very fast, so we are going to get right into this conversation. On the stage with me, I have the Honorable Mike Duggan, the mayor of the city of Detroit. And Mayor, I just have to tell you, after your presentation this morning, I have never been more proud to be a resident and a native Detroiter. All Thank right. you for what you're doing. We also have Jeffrey Connor Naylor, Deputy Director for Ready Nation. We have Nancy Moody, Vice President, Public Affairs for DTE Energy and Chair of the DTE Energy Foundation. Donna Murray Brown, President and CEO of Michigan Nonprofit Association. Arturo Vargas, CEO for the National Association of Latino Elected and Appointed Officials Education Fund. Thank you for joining us. I'd also like to say as we begin, you each have a card on your tables. Um, the information in the video is on this card. You are going to want to use this card. These are your talking points for how we make sure that everyone understands the significance of the 2020 census. And secondly, I'd like to uh, point out on every table we have question cards. We know we may not get to every question during this panel, but if you have a question, please document the question. If we don't get to your question through the Q&A, we will follow up afterwards and make sure that we can respond to any questions that you have. So with that, I will begin the conversation. And I'd like to start with a general question for each of you. Uh, and again, just to help everyone fully understand why this is so important for each and every one of us. And so I'll start, and I'm going to start with the mayor. Um, mayor Duggan, why do you think this conversation about the 2020 census is so important? And how is it important to you, to the state of Michigan, to the city of Detroit, and to the work that you do every day? Well, I think people probably know the 2010 census count in Detroit was pretty well a disaster. The city was preoccupied with other things, and the implications are terrible. I mean, a huge amount of federal and state resources come in based on uh, how people are counted, and whether it's education funds, whether it's money for hot lunch for children's, Medicaid funding, a whole range of things. $1,800 a year per person is basically what we lose. So you think about that, 18,000 over a decade and my perspective is very personal. In 1980, when I was an undergrad at the University of Michigan, my summer job was a census taker. Mm -hmm. I worked for the Census Bureau. <laughs> and I spent the summer knocking on doors in Ann Arbor. And I can tell you firsthand, the racial undercount is real. People who say theory or anything else, I knocked on doors and I saw it for myself in racially mixed neighborhoods that people of color, when the government comes to ask you questions about your life, are less likely to answer uh, than our Caucasians. It's the truth. And that means that when you try to do a count in these areas, we need people who they trust, who are from the neighborhoods, who have the same kind of background, and it means you need to go back more and more often. And so in the city of Detroit, at least, and Don is doing a phenomenal job uh, at the broader thing, we're going to have a very intense door-knocking effort 
to go in behind the census takers uh, to get everybody uh, counted. But it's going to be one of the great mobilization efforts uh, that we've seen, and, and we need it. Thank you. Yes. Uh, let's just go down quickly. Why is this important to you? And um, you know, what do you want to point out as we begin this conversation around the 2020 census? Sure. So I work with a national uh, business organization. We work on, uh, we promote uh, programs and uh, uh, policies that help build a strong uh, workforce and economy. Uh, and we know that an, uh, an accurate count is going to be a one-two punch for um, businesses across the United States. On the one hand, um, businesses are uh, driven by information. Um, and the census is really the foundation of um, their decisions around where to open up a new store, uh, an office, a uh, factory, what uh, products to offer on shelves. So on the one hand, uh, we don't want um, companies to make a decision with um, inaccurate info. But on the other hand, it's also used to distribute uh, effectively those um, public funds that help grow the economy, education, roads, um, health care, and so on. Thank you, Nancy. Well, at DTE Energy, we have an aspiration to be best operated energy company in North America and a force for growth and prosperity in the communities where we live and serve. So that second piece of that is why we know that the census is one of the most important projects we will possibly have for the next year. If you look at the ecosystem of trying to rebuild a middle class, you know that you need education and employment. And we do so much work with the mayor's office on workforce development. And all of the other pieces of the ecosystem come with federal dollars attached. So for $18,000 a person, we know that that $18,000 a person has to be brought out so that we can get the education and training that is needed for individuals and that we can provide the rest of the services that those federal dollars will provide and that will all contribute toward rebuilding the middle class. And by the way, at DTE, not unlike many other businesses around Michigan, and I think around the nation, we have a workforce shortage. And yet we know we have the folks who can take the work if only they are trained. So training dollars, exceedingly important. And our selfish motivation is get those people <laughs> trained. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And that's not selfish, because we all benefit we when all that benefit. happens. Yeah. Absolutely. Donna. So thinking about Michigan uh, Nonprofit Association, we have the unique position to really hear what the needs are of nonprofit organizations across the state. And many of you already talked about the many things that they do in terms of services and providing that. And so when you think about the needs of, of nonprofit organizations, it's simply resources to be able to do the great work that they do. And hearing more than 40% of the state's uh, uh, budget actually coming from federal dollars and those going into community, it really provides a challenge if we don't get a complete count. But then you also asked about personally. And so one of the things that drives me personally, and I think even the values of, of the staff that work at Michigan Nonprofit Association is about those that are underrepresented in the count. We don't often talk about them. And quite frankly, they were my family in Detroit who were very apathetic about completing the census, right? And so these are the same individuals in communities across um, the state who really don't necessarily understand how they fit and how they matter and how their voices can make a difference. And this is the first step they can do that by actually being counted in the census. So it's uh, very important to me personally and professionally. Great, thank you. Arturo, thank you for joining us. Uh, and sure. I want to just share with you all that Arturo has uh, at least four decades of experience yes. working <laughs> on census. Shh. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but with that 
experience that you have and thinking about this upcoming process, what concerns you this time as we think about this uh, national process? Yeah, th thank you, Lejeune, and thank you for the opportunity to yes. be here. Uh, this is evidence that I will travel anywhere to talk about the census. <laughs> <That is it. laughs> I'm from Los Angeles. <laughs> You know, I have been a member of the Census Bureau's National Advisory Committee on Racial, Ethnic, and Other Population Groups for the past six years, having served with Hassan Jaber of Access. Mm -hmm. And we have had a front row seat mm -hmm. since that time, since really since 2008. I served on the predecessor two committees as well, appointed by both Republican and Democrat Secretaries of Commerce. Mm -hmm. I've been watching the, the Bureau plan 2020 with some grand ideas of innovation mm -hmm. to become more efficient, to count the population more completely and more accurately. It's not the same thing. That's Completeness right. and accuracy mm -hmm. are two different concepts when it comes to the census, and the Bureau has been trying to do that. And I can tell you this, the 2020 census operation that the Bureau now is about to implement is not the 2020 census operation it has been planning since 2008. Mm -hmm for a number of reasons. Number one, first, blame sits with Congress. Congress did not fully appropriate resources requested from the, by the Census Bureau for the past five years so that the Bureau could ad adequately plan, prepare, and test all of the things it wanted to do differently and new and more efficiently for 2020. As a consequence, the Bureau is going into 2020 not really knowing what's going to happen. Let me give you an example. Last year was supposed to have been the final field test. In the years ending in eight, the Bureau calls it the dress rehearsal. Anybody here a performer? I know there's a hands here. I know that. <laughs> <laughs> when you do a dress rehearsal, it's, it's as if it's the real thing, because you want to know what's going to go wrong. How do you fix it? You know, you don't stop halfway through if somebody forgets their lines. You keep going because you want to know, is it going to work? The Bureau did not put in that operation in 2018 because it didn't have the funding. Instead, it did something it called the end-to-end -end test and only tested the systems, the computers. Will the computers work? Well, thank goodness for that because the last thing we want out of census.gov is another health.gov. Mm -hmm. Out of that operation, the Bureau does not know everything that will happen in 2020. It tested it only in one site an urban site, Providence County, Rhode Island. It had plans to test it in rural sites, agricultural sites. Those tests did not happen, so as a consequence, mm. the Bureau doesn't know. Is it gonna work in rural Michigan? Because there was no testing done in the rural environment. So that's number one, consequences of underfunding. Number two, and this isn't a partisan statement, there is a political agenda to interfere with the Census Bureau's operations. The professionals and the scientists at the Census Bureau know what they need to do to get the job done, and now they're being forced to do things that they know will lead to an undercount of certain populations. And one of those things is the last minute addition of an untested question on citizenship. Now, I know there'll be some people saying, what is wrong with the United States knowing how many citizens it has? absolutely nothing wrong with that, which is why the Census Bureau already asks in the American Community Survey a citizenship question. Mm -hmm. And the Census Bureau determined that asking that particular question of a sample leads to more complete and accurate citizenship data than if it were to ask that question on the 100% decennial question, which is why the professionals at the Bureau said no, we do not want to add that question to the 2020 census at this point. Every single question on the, on the form has a consequence for response rates. The way you word it, mm -hmm. if you say, what is this person's gender and what is this person's sex, that elicits different response rates. If you ask name and then age and then gender, that elicits different response rates. Mm -hmm. Now we have a brand new question and the Bureau has no idea what's going to happen. And we all need to be very worried about the ability of the Census Bureau to fulfill its mission. Thank you so much, Arturo. <clears throat>
And again, what I'd like to do is point out today is why this is important for all of us. You see we have a very diverse panel. We have public officials, business leaders, nonprofits, philanthropy, and we are all equally concerned about this particular uh, piece of work that we have to accomplish. We get one shot at this for a decade. And it's so important that we get this right. So I'd like to go back to Jeffrey. And Jeffrey, if you could just talk a little bit more about why mm -hmm. is it so important for the business community to understand and engage in this work as we address this going forward? Great. So um, you know, this is obviously an all hands on deck um, collaborative. Mm -hmm. So across the United States, uh, what we are um, recommending is to uh, partner with either the Census uh, Bureau, with us, with a local complete count um, initiative. We have developed our own um, initiative called uh, Business for the 2020 um, Census. And the purpose of this is to make it easy for a company to uh, participate in the count in some way. Uh, we have a public um, task force which DTE uh, participates in and we are very glad to have their support. Uh, there are 30 plus um, companies or uh, business uh, membership organizations that participate in that group. The uh, purpose of that group is really to show that we have strong um, business support for the count. Kind of the flip side of that, though, is we also want to provide support to um, companies who want to participate in some way. Uh, if there is a company where there is a robust um, census initiative in their town, we want to connect them to that. Um, if there is not, um, or if they want additional help, we are here to provide um, resources, support, um, materials. We've developed a free uh, uh, private email uh, network that we will use to share information about the count, share the uh, resources that we are going to um, develop. We, ha we have already uh, developed a report that lays out what a uh, company can do to support the count. It includes examples from 2000, from uh, 2010 and from what uh, companies plan to do um, next year as well, and DTE is in that report as well. <laughs> um, however, we also want to make sure that census initiatives have um, support as well. We know that the Bureau is going to have less um, boots on the ground this time around, uh, so we're there to provide that support, to provide those materials, to provide um, technical assistance uh, to groups on the ground. So if you are interested in any of this, just hand me your um, business card on the uh, way out, and I'll make sure to connect with you after this event. Thank you, Jeffrey. Mayor Duggan, as we think about the city of Detroit and uh, possibly those hard-to-count communities right. within the city, are you and your team thinking about strategies to reach those hard-to-count populations? Uh, there's, there's no question about it. We, we have to do it. And, and uh, what Arturo said is right. There is no question there is a strategy at the national level uh, to undercount people of color. You just look at the patterns of what's been done. And the citizenship question, understand how malicious this is. The U.S. Constitution has never provided for the counting of citizens. It talked about the counting of inhabitants. So you think about when the Constitution was written. Nobody was born an American citizen. They were born British citizens or they're Native American, Spanish citizens. The, this Constitution is provided in this country. We always counted inhabitants. The only reason to inject a citizenship question is to raise fears uh, that it's going to be used in a way. And uh, we have fewer offices, fewer census workers, uh, and everybody knows that it takes more effort uh, to count in minority communities. And so what we are going to do 
uh, is run something I know very well. We're going to run an intensive door-to-door -door field campaign. Now, the good news is the professionals working for the Census Bureau, those who are hired, they're dedicated. The ones who are on the ground, they're trying to do a good job, and they're working with us. But they can't share with us by law who filled out a form and who can't. They can tell you within a particular census tract area, we got a 44% return or a 72% return. This is the first year you're going to be able to do it electronically. So you're going to fill out your census form online. We're going to have uh, laptops at every rec center, community place in America to encourage you to do it. Mm -hmm. The census takers door to door are going to have tablets or iPads with them to fill them out. And so we're going to be able to send people behind with tablets. We're going to have to get folks to, to fill out the forms themselves. But you think about what this is going to take. We are on a daily basis going to get raw data from the Census Bureau. So somewhere uh, around April or so, they send out the mail. You fill it out voluntarily. And then where you haven't filled it in, they come knock on doors. We're going to come in behind. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, Serena Abu Chakra is here. Serena, stand up. Uh, so she is right now helping raise the money for our effort. Uh, and we need to put together $3 million ourselves to put people on the ground to go behind to make sure uh, Detroit gets counted. But you're going to see one of the most sophisticated follow-up door-to-door efforts at census counts uh, that they've uh, been done in the country. And uh, I feel like we're, we're getting organized early, and we're going to give it a shot. Right. Can I follow up on something Please that the do. mayor said about when the Constitution was written <laughs> in Citizen? Let's not forget when the Constitution was written, African-American slaves were considered to be only three-fifths of a person for purposes of the census. Mm -hmm. The census is born in the racism of this country. The 14th Amendment tried to erase that by assuring that this becomes an enumeration of all persons. Male or female, you count as one. Gay, straight, lesbian, transgender, you count as one. One year old, 18 years old, 21 years old, 100 years old, you count as one. Mm -hmm. Experiencing homelessness or exceptional wealth, you count as one. Law abiding or felon, you count as one right. if you're counted. That's right. Mm -hmm. This is the only thing the federal government does in which all of us truly are equal. We all count as one as a person. And any effort to undermine that undermines our constitutional values mm -hmm. and our whole belief in equity and equality in this country. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Absolutely. Donna, mm -hmm. talk a little bit about what MA will do in yeah. the state to make sure that we all count as so, one. Yeah, absolutely. So I just want to say, what you said is the very reason why we started. And we started two years ago, by the way, too. We started our efforts recognizing that the infrastructure was going to be less than it was before, like you mentioned. Mm -hmm. and, and we stated that if we wanted to make certain that those who didn't have a voice, who were shut out or felt shut out by the process, that that's exactly where we thought we could leverage the trust of nonprofit organizations that are serving those communities. And typically, they're communities of color, non-English speaking communities, children, all of that you named there. And uh, who serves those populations? Nonprofit organizations. So we rolled up our sleeves, and we have a campaign that is serving the entire state of Michigan. We have 13 hubs that are positioned to be able, they are grant making institutions like community foundations and United Way that can put, United Ways that can put money out into communities to do those unique strategies that the mayor talked about that nonprofits who are really in the community can leverage some funds and be able to make uh, people understand that they matter and that they count. We also have par partnered with the Michigan Community um, Action, which is community action agencies across the state that reach in the rural communities as well as in the urban communities to make sure that we have coverage and access to information. Because one of the things that we found through this campaign and through those that are underrepresented is that there is little information about the census itself why it's important. What does it even look like? What does the documentation look like when you uh, receive that? Now that it's going to be on the internet, we know that there is some divide there. But like the mayor said, let's lean into that technology and make our, our approaches more mobile so we can go to people and make certain that they actually get counted. So we are across the entire state. We have money that is actually going into communities, and we're making a difference, leveraging uh, the trust 
of nonprofits. I'm really excited about it. And Lucien, can I, can I just say something yes. what Donna has done? Because it's been remarkable. Uh, in this state, and particularly in the city, we got factions that fight with each other very passionately all the time. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and they rage uh, on, on the perspective of the political scale. What they have done is pull together everybody. No matter what our political beliefs are, no matter what our priorities are, we have people in the room who usually shout at each other who are smiling and working together because we all agree on this. That's right. We're going to get everybody right. counted. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, Nancy, DTE. Yes. What will DTE do? You guys are so busy making profits and running. <laughs> Thank you. We do our best. <laughs> and we're glad that you do. But what, what are you planning as it relates to the 2020 census at we DTE? We have a whole spectrum of things that are planned. And I think if you look at it in terms of time, talent, and treasure, mm -hmm. you'll come up with the answers. Mm -hmm. So time, we have 10,000 employees. We have 10,000 contract employees. We probably have 10,000 retirees in the state of Michigan. Yes. And we intend to use all of those people if they are so willing, but we will certainly make sure they're aware of the opportunities mm -hmm. to get out into the neighborhoods block by block by block. The mayor said it, this is a field campaign. Mm -hmm. It is a door to door field campaign. So we have people, number one, talent. We have computers. We have a lot of computers with a lot of computer know-how. Yeah. We combining our service with that actual technology in the field, we can make sure that everybody who gets to the place to be able to input their data can input their data properly. Thank so you. that is a second major piece that we can provide. And last, treasure. So that one is, in a way, the easiest of all. Give money. Because every one of these campaigns across Michigan not just in the city, although you better believe we're very engaged in the city because we've got, well, we'll find out, maybe 700,000 people. We'll find out. But it's exceedingly important, as you said, Lejeune, every person counts. And the only way we can make sure every person counts is that every person is counted. Absolutely. Right. Thank That's you. Right. And thank you, DTE. Arturo. Help us understand what we can do to support making sure that every Latino person is counted in, the, in, the, in our state and everywhere, given the climate in this country and the fear that is being uh, just uh, exuded through uh, the Latino communities. Help us understand how we can be in solidarity in this work. Uh Jeff said it, it's all hands on deck. And I think we also need to understand the components of the undercount in the Latino community. We thought that this census was going to be the one where we finally got to the issue of the undercount of very young Latino children. Mm -hmm. You know, there were 2.2 million children ages zero to four who were not counted in 2010. I'm sorry, yeah, 2.2 million were not counted 1.2 million children were overcounted. Not the same children, by the way. Mm -hmm. The children missed was largely children of color and poor children. Children counted more than once were largely white and in wealthy families. The net undercount was about a million children not counting, counted. 40% of them Latino children, mm. where Latino children make up 24% of America's children. So there is an undercount of Latino children. The other thing we've learned by forcing the Bureau to actually study as to why this happens is that the majority of children missed in the census lived in households that responded to the 2020 census. They sent a form back. Mm -hmm. right. And as far as the Census Bureau is concerned, check that house enumerated. Mm -hmm. Even though people were left off, children were left off that form. Some adult in that household made the conscious decision <laughs> not to include every child. Maybe that child wasn't directly related. Well, it's not my son, it's my nephew. Or it's my sister's family who's living here temporarily. Don't forget, 2010, Great Recession, mortgage crisis, people lost homes, mm -hmm. people had to move in together. Mm -hmm. So not everybody in a, living in a household may have been included. 
So we need to make sure that we understand, again, the components of the undercount, that there are structural reasons why people are left off, not just attitudinal. But then the attitudinal ones. I believe that part of the reason to inject a citizenship question is to scare people away from being coming. Because this is coming from the same administration that's saying, we're going to can cancel DACA. We're going to cancel temporary protected status. We're going to change the rules on public charge. We're going to institute a Muslim ban. And we're going to build a wall. And are you a citizen? Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's, what, that's the situation we find ourselves in, to convince folks that this federal government, given all its policies towards immigrants, the fact that it's asking you to be a citizen, if you're a citizen or not, you shouldn't be afraid of it. Yeah. I had to stand up and assure people in my community not to be afraid. Mm -hmm. And I have to rely on Title 13 of the US Code, That's right. which assures confidentiality in the data that are collected. Because I know that every Census Bureau employee takes an oath for life, that they will keep the information confidential, and if they violate the confidentiality, they can serve up to five years in federal prison and be fined $250,000. Mm -hmm. That's what I have to stand on to assure people of that. And sometimes I am not the right messenger to communicate right. that. <laughs> right. Yes. But, and Mr. Mayor, mm -hmm. neither are you. Because mm -hmm. elected officials sometimes are the least credible mm -hmm. when it comes to this issue. Who does it need to come from? Teachers. Mm -hmm. If the teacher said it, it must be true. Healthcare providers. If the doctor at the clinic told us about the census, then it must be true. Mm -hmm. If the lady working in the lunchroom, who knows everything that's going on in the community, if she says it, that's it must right. be true. That's right. If my pastor or priest says it, then it must be true. Those are the people that we need right. to stand up and to help us assure everybody gets counted in the census. So to that point, we're going to do a quick round. What are we asking this audience to do when they leave this room? Quickly, we'll go through, and then we have some great questions here, and we'll turn to Q&A. Jeffrey, we'll just start with you. What are we asking this audience to do? Great. So if you work for a um, company, for a uh, chamber, begin to think now about how you can help engage your employees, engage your um, customers around the count. Um, March 15th is when the uh, census will begin to be in the field in mass. Um, and a company can help by encouraging folks to fill out their forms early. When they fill out their forms early, it means that we don't have to use um, resources to go knock on doors. So if we count them on the early end, then we can use those to go count other folks who are hard or harder to count. And we are here to help, so give me your business card. Great, thank you. <laughs> Mayor I would say a few things. One is we just need to get the facts out. That is, it is against federal law for the Census Bureau to share the information with any other federal agency, with any state agency, with any local agency, it is a federal crime for 70 years. They release the data 70 years later. If you had relatives who lived here in 1940, you can actually look up their census forms. It is locked up and it is secure. Second, if you're in Detroit, I'll tell you why it's particularly important. Uh, and while the, the took a step forward today on car insurance, we have a whole lot of people who are residing in apartments in the city of Detroit who claim they live in the suburbs. In fact, two-thirds of the people living in Riverfront Towers and 1300 Lafayette claim they live in the suburbs because of car insurance. Mm -hmm. And one of our messages, mm -hmm. because the new law is not going to take effect on car insurance until July 1st of 2020, is this. You can honestly fill out your census form where you sleep at night. Uh, and because we need you to be counted in the city, and it's not shared with any other agency. And that's going to be a message that's going to be really yes. important to get out to Detroiters, mm -hmm. be honest, uh, and fill out uh, it accurately because the city needs the resources. And third, I would say we're going to be on the ground in the neighborhoods. It'll be next March, April, May, June, July. But if you've got a company who wants to participate, you can talk to Serene today, mm -hmm. uh, but we're going to be out 
hitting doors every single day with our iPads uh, sometime uh, next spring. Uh, and it is going to be a massive volunteer effort. And if you want to get signed up now and start to get educated now, we'd love to have you. Mm -hmm. All right, so and I think absolutely already between now and then, it's all about communications, communications, communications. And businesses and nonprofits and other organizations all have mechanisms. We have digital, we have print, we have word of mouth. So every association can do this, every business can do this. Every nonprofit partner can do it. And I think it's also important when you start looking at the nationwide effort that we all have industry, well, I have industry associations in business, but we each have national associations. Right. Spread the word through your national associations to be doing the same thing and raising the awareness of the importance of getting the count right. Great, thank you. I would say if everybody can accept that they can do something, that's the first step. There's something that you can do about it. The first thing is really talking about the census itself. It is easy, it's only 10 questions. You can even say that. Now you know, it's only 10 I questions. I you were nine. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I love it. I love it. <laughs> but the reality of it is, if any of us have um, engaged in social media, um, you probably put a lot more about yourself on that than is going to be asked um, um, on the census. Yeah. So, be quite, if you want to look at it that way, yeah. so I just want to be able to share that it's um, it is it is safe, and we talked we heard about that. Um, but it's utterly important, right? And so just making sure that you you recognize that. I also would say too is that coordination, communication, like Nancy said, is is utterly important. But also the coordination. We don't want duplication of efforts. This is a, a particular task is going to end on a particular date. We have finite resources. We have a goal to get over the finish line. We have to all work together. Mm -hmm. So if you can't find your place or you don't know, talk to someone, get coordinated, and make certain that we're efficient and effective in our efforts uh, for Census 2020. Great. Thank you. Artura? Well, speaking to a business community, we need your support. We need your involvement. Two ways. One is through your businesses. Reach your clients, your customers. You can be a trusted voice right. to the people you serve and you provide services to. Uh, people trust you if they come to you for a product or a service. If you communicate about the census, that helps create that echo chamber that this is important and that all of us are harmed when someone in our community is not counted. Right. Second, invest in the nonprofit sector that's mobilizing mm -hmm. uh, to turn out the count. The U.S. government can only do so much and say so much to convince people. They're going to spend millions on a big ad campaign, and they're going to buy, you know, in 2010, they bought a Super Bowl ad. I don't know if you remember that. And that's where the millions are going to go. We need millions to go into the community. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And we need your support for that. Great. And I'm going to transition to questions, but I just wanted to share with you a little bit about what philanthropy is thinking about this. Why would the Kellogg Foundation host this session? Well, as we've heard on the panel, children are one of the most uh, highly undercounted populations, as well as people of color, and we've heard the reasons why. What we've done at the Kellogg Foundation is thought about this both at a national level as well as the local level. And I want to share with you that uh, some people say philanthropy has a hard time coming together, but lately that has, sh that has changed. It has changed nationally, it has changed, as, as Ma Mayor Duggan spoke of earlier, is definitely changing in the city of Detroit. At the national level, philanthropy has amassed over $30 million to help support populations across the nation who are uh, identified as undercounted or underrepresented, hard to count places. Our foundation gave $5 million to that national mm. effort. Not our places, not our programming priorities, but we understand this is a national issue regardless of what our particular interests are. And this is important for every person, every child, regardless of our foundation. So we are funding not only at the national level, but also in the state of Michigan, supporting MA and the work that's happening on the ground. And we will continue to do that. That's why uh, it's just an example of how important we believe this is. No matter what your cause, no matter what your business, you do care that we have an accurate count uh, as it relates to the 2020 census. And so with that, I'm going to turn to questions. I don't know if anyone wants to stand up and ask a question. Uh, the microphone is going around. 
And if there aren't any hands, I do have a few, thank you, that have come to the front. Any questions? Here are a couple. If people leave the citizenship question blank, is that a problem in no. how they are counted? It's still counted. They, uh, they will count whatever questions you answer. Great question. But yeah, that's a the Census Bureau has added one more test that it, again, unplanned, because it doesn't know what's going to happen. So they added one more test that's going to begin next month. They're going to mail out 480,000 questionnaires. Half of those questionnaires will go to uh, half of the households, of the 480,000 households, will receive a questionnaire with the citizenship question, half without. The Bureau is then going to try to measure response rates. They're going to do no response follow-up. Mm. Based on those response rates, they're then going to adjust their non-response follow-up procedures. We won't know the results of that test until October. When people ask me that question, I honestly tell them, I don't know. I don't know because the Census Bureau doesn't know. Mm -hmm. And that's the problem with adding an untested question at this point. Mm -hmm. The mayor's right. Historically, if one or two questions are left blank, the operation is so massive that it's impossible for the Census Bureau to follow up with every single household that leaves a question blank. Which is why this time around, the Census Bureau also wants to use administrative records to fill in the blanks and impute mm -hmm. missing data. So that's another issue. That's another issue. They are getting information from IRS, Medicaid, USCIS, the State Department, so that instead of sending an enumerator to knock on the door, if they can enumerate administratively, they're gonna do that as a cost saving strategy. We need to know this is happening, folks. Mm -hmm. Okay, let, let's make sure we don't scare people. <laughs> uh, so we're gonna be out knocking on doors, but the Census Bureau has always historically and certainly is advising us a policy that if you fail to answer a question or two, the rest of the data is still counted. And so when we go out and knock on doors, assuming that the citizenship test question isn't taken out by the courts by then, uh, we are going to be certainly saying to folks, we want you to answer all the questions, but if you don't, we are going to be encouraging them. We're going to try to make this reassuring because we need to get people uh, to count. So it's going to be a little bit different message coming from us. <laughs> well, that, this is a message for you as leaders. <laughs> <laughs> you need to know the information. You need to know what's happening. Yeah. Right. You, know, that's, you know, we have to be transparent and honest about what's yeah. happening in the country. Yeah. Uh, how we communicate that to the public, how we provide assurances, that's a different strategy. Yeah. I agree. Great. Thank you. One more question here. My name is Ken Winter and I work for Dome and Bridge Magazine and your legal counsel is uh, one of my seasonal neighbors from Petoskey. Can't oh, yes. <laughs> promise her I'd come today. <laughs> Mayor Duggan, I'm interested in knowing how you will use this data to talk about the com concern you've had about education and flight to the suburbs, which has been one of the blocks I haven't heard you talk about today, but other years you have. If we don't have good schools in Detroit, all these millennials are going to continue going to the suburbs for schools. No, you're right. In fact, I get every, the first of every month, DTE sends me over <laughs> the data of all of the utility hookups. Mm -hmm. And their numbers show that there is more population than the census numbers show. Their number shows us another thing, and it's your point, which is the number of households has increased significantly in the last three or four years. The population hasn't increased significantly because one in two person households have been moving into the city, mm -hmm. families with children continue uh, to move out. And this data is extremely important in our planning. And what Dr. Vitti and the Detroit Public Schools do uh, is going to be absolutely uh, critical. But as you can tell from this conversation, it's something I study uh, very, very carefully <laughs> and very conscious of. Great, thank you. I have one question here and then we'll go back to the floor. This question is asking if a state claims that there is an undercount and they're using obviously different data than what's coming through the census, um, how are they able to challenge the federal government as it relates to the count if they believe there is an undercount? There have been many, many lawsuits filed by cities and by states challenging the official count that the Census Bureau releases. 
to my, uh, to my knowledge, no lawsuit has been successful. Uh, Utah, last time around, uh, challenged the fact that the Bureau did not include Mormon missionaries mm -hmm. that were on their missions uh, temporarily. Mm -hmm. And Utah argued that they should have been counted because they were going to come back. Uh, but the residency rules were such that if your usual place of residence on April 1, of the year ending is zero, is not in the United States, then you don't live here and you're not to be counted. Mm -hmm. And unless the makeup of the U.S. Supreme Court changes radically in the next few years, it's not going to help us on this undercount issue. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great. Other questions from the floor? Thank you. Hi, uh, Darian Driver Hudson, CEO of United Way for Southeastern Michigan. Uh, my question uh, was for Mayor Duggan. You had mentioned that you're trying to raise $3 million. How close are you to that goal? And then what is the, you know, in, the end date that you need right. that money? So, so we've got 500000 in hand, a million committed, and uh, Serene's job depends upon raising the other million and a half by the end of the year. Uh, no pressure. So uh, I have full confidence in her, but, but we need to raise it over the course of this year. So we've got the early early volunteer efforts and organizing being set up now, we're going to have to be paying a whole lot of people to be knocking on doors in the early part of next year. So sometime in the next few months would be enormously helpful. Great. Here's another question related to that. Uh, someone is asking, is there a certification or a training that a person has to go through if they want to help or a nonprofit organization? has to go through in order to help. Donna? So I can talk about, um, as a nonprofit organization, we do have a website that is um, available for you to, to get resources and training uh, from that. So that's becountedmi2020.org. And there are resources there to, to do that. And we uh, will be partnering with others to do training. We are working with an ethnic media group as well that's going to be doing training on media and around messaging, which, by the way, is something unique for, um, for our efforts this year because in 2010 there was lots of um, opportunity, but no one took advantage necessarily of partnering uh, very directly with ethnic media. This time we're being very purposeful and making certain that we are partnering with them to make certain that there are messages, the right messages, getting into community the way that it should. So there'll be some training um, around that as well. Great. Is there a question here? The information Donna just provided is on this card. Thank you. Um, other questions? <laughs> so I have a question. I, I don't remember from past censuses that businesses, now, now we have digital, we can do these things online. Did companies say, okay, it's census afternoon. You get 30 minutes to go online. We're giving everybody a break and making a big deal out of it. D is that legal? Can we do that? Do employers do that? Have they done it before? And should we be thinking about that? Well, it's interesting. In the past, you had a paper mailed to your house. And so you tended to do it at home. But it's an interesting idea, because mm -hmm. this is the first year uh, folks are going to be able to go online. And we're saying to people, relatively simple. It's uh, 10 questions that'll take you 10 minutes that'll fund your community for the next 10 years. If we did something like that on the business side, right. I think that that's a great idea. I haven't heard, I maybe, like it too. I haven't well, heard that, that suggestion. That communications <laughs> message, Mary. Yeah. 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 Great. Thank yeah. you. Did I see there's a hand in the back? Um, we got to get Mary to join the complete count committee. Yeah, I know. Yeah, yeah. exactly. That's a great idea. So while we're getting to that question, the question on the card says, what's the timeline? And when will the census be administered? The actual timeline for this process. So the first mailings will start going out on March 12th. It's going, they're going to go out in four waves because the census bureau does not want to overload the computers. By March 19th, every single address for which the Census Bureau has an address will have received an initial mailing. 20% of households in that initial mailing will receive a paper form from the get-go. We don't yet know which 20% of those households will be. And we want to know that so that we can adjust our get-out-the-count efforts. Mm -hmm. 
there will be a total of four mailings, two reminders if you don't respond. By the fourth mailing that will come in mid-April, if a household still doesn't respond, that household will get a paper form. Mm -hmm. So everybody will get a paper form eventually because we know many people would rather use paper than not. The self-response period ends April 30th. May 1st is when the non-response follow-up period begins. If you don't respond by April 30th, then your household gets put into that universe of follow-up, and that's when the Bureau first will try to complete or enumerate administratively, mm -hmm. and if unable to, then that's when they start deploying enumerators to try to get the information from a non-responding household. Mm -hmm. Everything, the operation ends by July 31st, the data have to be reported to the White House to apportion the House of Representatives by December 31st, 2020. So I know I'm the moderator, but I have a follow-up. <laughs> <laughs> so how do we know as uh, foot soldiers on the ground, uh, the households that are, have not responded that require follow-up, is there well, some communication we, back we won't know from the federal which government? households don't respond, because that would be a violation of Title 13 right. confidentiality. Okay. But we will know response rates right. by census tracts. Well, I don't know if it's census tracts or, or zip codes. Well, we're, ta we're talking about narrow, but they haven't given us yeah. an answer on that. So the Census Bureau is going to be able to give us real-time response rates. Mm -hmm so that we could then adjust our rapid response modes like, hey, this neighborhood is falling, Mexican town, it's, mm -hmm. it's called in Detroit, right? Yeah, yeah that's right. <laughs> it's falling behind on response right. rates. Mm -hmm. Let's deploy resources there. Let's mm -hmm. you know, rally up the troops. Mm -hmm. uh, there will be that opportunity during non-response follow-up. So the intense period again being March 12th to April 30th. Then May 1 to July, uh, 31st, that's when the Bureau then goes into the field. Mm -hmm. And let's be careful about not stumbling over their work exactly. because they are going to be going to the households that haven't replied. Crazy. And it's going to be somewhat awkward. If you think about mm -hmm. uh, this, they, they cannot share with us whether Mrs. Jones filled out a form or not. Mm -hmm. They can say, in this area, we're asking for blocks, but maybe it'll be census tracts. You have a 55% response rate. Your average is, say, 65% we will send people to knock on doors. We have to say to them, did you fill out the census? Mm -hmm. If they say yes, we have no way of knowing if they're telling us the truth. Uh, and uh, if they say no, then we, we try to convince them. So this is not an easy thing. So we're gonna have to educate folks mm -hmm. that we are going out to knock on doors. Don't be troubled if somebody asks you uh, if you filled out the census and you already have. Uh, that's a great thing, uh, let them know. Uh, but, but in some ways, you know, we got kind of a blindfold on as we do this. Uh, but if we get uh, the messaging from people in the community saying, folks are going to be out, you need to do this, this is important, it can't be used, uh, that's what we're going to try. Yeah. I also think that timeline that was just shared with us is utterly important, too, for people to know when things start and when they end and when it's critically important because next year is going to be a presidential election. Mm -hmm. There's going to be lots of other distractions. We have to understand When's the Michigan when, primary? Uh, March. 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 So we've got all of this. So, so we've got all of this happening is what I'm saying. And so recognizing the timeline um, for the census and when we need to activate and when those messages, I mean, all of us in this room should accept the responsibility of at minimum talking to our friends and family about this and understanding, understanding all the details so that you can champion this effort. It is all hands on deck, as Jeffrey but said. But you said it earlier, I think it's really important to make sure we're working in an organized absolutely. fashion too, yes, right? Absolutely. So we've gotta go where the hubs are yes. and not try to do our own separate thing. Mm -hmm. Exactly, Thank great. You. We'll take the last question in the back. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Omari Rush. Mm -hmm. I'm the director of Culture Source, uh, mm -hmm. Southeast Michigan's Alliance of Arts and Cultural Organizations. Mm -hmm. And um, as a bit of a follow up to Mary's question, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about what you all feel is ethical, not ethical, legal or not legal um, regarding incentivizing people to um, fill out the census, you know? Um, yeah. I'm not aware of any Thank legal you. restrictions. I don't think there are any legal issues to no, incentivize. But I don't the, think you're aware of that. The law does require that we all respond to the census. It's a mm -hmm. violation of federal law not, not to, to mm -hmm. fill out your census form. You can right. be fined up to $100. If you answer falsely, 
you can be fined up to $500. Mm -hmm. Now, there are lots of folks who have been saying, oh, hashtag, skip the, skip the question, hashtag, leave it blank. Uh, people who do that are gonna be encouraging people to violate the law. And there's gonna be liability for that. So we need to be very careful about how we communicate that nuance right. if you wanna leave the question blank. Now, as far as incentivizing, hey, if you fill out your census form, come to my donut shop, you get a free donut, why not? Why not? <laughs> right. DTE could offer 10 pay, 10 percent off. Your pay stuff. <laughs> Such creativity! Oh, right. right here. <laughs> I love I that. Oh, I know. <laughs> That's great. Boy, there's a lot of innovation that can get out of Get a free Waymo ride. <laughs> Uh, finally, to this point, uh, the last question that I have here is, uh, how do we make sure that the information isn't shared with ICE? Title 13 of uh, the U.S. Yeah. Code prohibits uh, the sharing of any personal information. Now, this is like individual information cannot be shared. The thing that many folks are concerned about is in the aggregate, statistical data are gonna be available for researchers, for people to study, how those data are used, mm -hmm. um, that's another conversation. Mm -hmm. But personal information about a household's response answers, that cannot be shared with ICE or anybody else. Yeah. And we are out of time, and let me just say as we close, thank you all for being here. Remember, this is our one shot for the next 10 years. We need every last one of you to join us and figure out how you can make a difference to make sure that every person